Good evening and welcome to the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute's April Science Hour. I'm Chris Bolzan, GMGI's Executive Director. Tonight, you will hear from Mandy Holford, Doctor and Associate Professor at Hunter College in New York. Dr. Holford will share her groundbreaking work from mollusks to medicine and the power of venom. And we are so excited to hear from her. GMGI addresses critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education. By bringing world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront, GMGI is catalyzing the regional economy. A strategy triad guides our work. Our research team, led by Dr. Andrea Bodner, our Donald G. Combe Science Director, whom you will hear from shortly, pursues a platform of advanced molecular biology and genomic technologies that is expanding our understanding of the world's oceans and accelerating discoveries that impact fisheries and human health. In the past year alone, they have cracked the lobster genome, published groundbreaking research on the long-lived red sea urchin, and made progress towards translating discoveries that will stimulate the local economy. Our education initiative led by Dr. John Doyle prepares recent high school graduates to become trained lab technicians through our Gloucester Biotechnology Academy. Construction right now is well underway on our new biomanufacturing learning environment, doubling the capacity of our program and enhancing our curriculum. The Academy class of 2021 completed their formal training and is currently under is currently engaged in their industry internships on Boston's North Shore, in Boston, and in Cambridge. We are so incredibly proud of them, and we're looking forward to their graduation, a milestone fifth ceremony for the Academy happening in June. Through our science community work, we actively promote conditions to encourage the establishment of a vibrant science community in and around Gloucester. This includes GMGI's annual science forum, which will take place this year on October 30th, and a second con conference we will introduce to Gloucester in the fall, focused on innovations in science education and biomanufacturing workforce development. Tonight, I encourage you to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions you might have for Dr. Holford. We've already see, received a lot of interesting comments and inquiries in advance. I know people are very excited about this topic. So don't hesitate to take advantage of this incredibly special opportunity to connect and engage with Dr. Holford. Thank you all for tuning in and for continuing to share our excitement for our oceans and science education. And a special thank you to the 1911 Trust Company managing North Shore and Boston Family Wealth for six generations and to the James and Gail Bacon Family Trust. I'll turn the screen now over to Dr. Bodner, who will introduce Dr. Holford. Andrea. Thanks, Chris, and good evening, everyone. I'm Andrea Bodner, the Donald G. Combs Science Director here at GMGI, and it's my pleasure to be introducing tonight's Science Hour speaker, uh, Mandy Holford. Mandy is an Associate Professor in Chemistry at Hunter College and City University of New York Graduate Center with scientific appointments at the American Museum of Natural History and Weill Cornell Medicine. Her research combines genomics, biology, and chemistry to discover novel peptides from venomous marine snails to and to develop these into novel therapeutics um, for treating pain and cancer. Mandy received her PhD in synthetic protein chemistry from the Rockefeller University and has received many honors throughout her career. These include being named a 2020 Sustainability Pioneer by the World Economic Forum, a Breakthrough Woman in Science by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and NPR's Science Friday, and a Wings World Quest Woman of Discovery Fellow. Mandy is also the recipient of the prestigious Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Award, a National Science Foundation Career Award, and she is a Fellow of the California Academy of Sciences. Mandy is actively involved in scientific education, in advancing public understanding of science, and in also science diplomacy. 
She is the founder of a company called Killer Snails, which is an award-winning learning games company that uses extreme creatures like venomous marine snails as a conduit to advance scientific learning in K-12 classrooms. I first met Mandy when she participated in uh, GMDI Science Forum in 2018, and her talk absolutely captivated the audience. So I'm very excited to have Mandy back with us again this evening. Um, and I'm sure you will enjoy uh, hearing more about her grand groundbreaking research that investigates the power of venom uh, to treat disease and to transform lives. And so with that, I wanna thank Mandy for joining us this evening, and I'm gonna turn things over to you. Hi, Andrea. Thank you. And thank you also for the in introduction. I'm so happy to be with you guys again. I, I wish I was there in Gloucester. It's so pretty <laughs> to be back at the Institute and to tour your new space. And glad that you guys have all moved in. Um, I'm going to share screen and start with my presentation. Uh, let's close uh, some of these things because then I um, don't get distracted and we'll start. So um, as, as Andrea said, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we do in my lab. And uh, we'd like to say we're going from beach to bench and beyond with Venom and, and talk about how we're using Venom in, uh, as a therapeutic for pain and, and cancer. When most people think of Venom and venomous animals, I think they think of them as agents of fear which of course makes sense, right? Because they are deadly, some of them. But when I think of them, I think of them as agents of change and innovation. And the reason is because that's how nature thinks of them, right? And so in this slide, everywhere that you see a red line, that is a venomous organism. And so we say that venom has a convergent evolution over time. That means that it independently evolved in each of these creatures. And so while you might know about snakes and scorpions, and spiders. Um, not too many people know that you can have venomous uh, sea cucumbers, or you can have venomous clams and snails, my specialty, or you can even have, you know, venomous starfish or a venomous um, uh, uh, platypus. And so uh, we think uh, that venom has, is about, venomous creatures make up about 15% of animal biodiversity, you can find them in the air, in the land, and in the sea. And I really think that this is an underestimate. So no matter where you are, you will not be able to escape a venomous animal. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is a little daunting when people first think about it, but it actually, I think it's a great thing because there's so much potential for what we can do with them. And so I work with Killer Snails, which is also the name of our um, ed tech company. And these are what these snails do. I, I love this video. So underneath the sand is a snail. The orange thing that you see is like a tongue called a proboscis. On the tip, it has a harpoon, which it will inject into the fish. And then this is the best part. It rises out of the sand and then it will engulf the fish hole. So the first time I saw a snail eat a fish, it sort of blew my mind because of course, Everyone would think that the fish would win. The fish should swim away. The fish is much faster. The fish has things to do and places to go and the snail is not gonna move as you see. Here, you'll see this again. We dug the snail up out of the sand. This is Conus bulatus. The orange chip again is the proboscis which has a harpoon on the end, a radular tooth that is filled with venom. And when it injects it into the fish, what do you notice? Instantly, the fish becomes paralyzed, right? So you see those fins are very stiff. So the fish doesn't have a chance. It's not gonna be able to escape. It's not gonna be able to run away. It's not gonna swim away. Um, and the snail is just gonna engulf it whole in its rostrum. And so pay attention because the snail, well, the fish is not really dead. So every time they envenomate doesn't mean that they kill. And you'll see that that fish tried to struggle, but it didn't work. So, so what's happening? Venom, I like to describe it kind of as like a cluster bomb, right? So it's not one thing, it's a complex mixture of several things. And these things are working in a concerted manner to shut down the physiological function of that prey. And so what exactly is in the complex mixture? The cocktail, we should say. Oh, if this was like, you know, regular times, we would all have a cocktail maybe <laughs> before or after. But this cocktail is a different kind. This is a toxic cocktail. We won't be drinking this one. So you'll have small molecules, you'll have peptides, and you have proteins. 
Peptides are just shorter versions of um, proteins, usually about 100 amino acids or less. And um, they're made up of small molecules, uh, amino acids, basically. My lab, we focus mostly on the peptides that are found in the venom. And so each snail can produce anywhere between 50 to 250 unique peptides in its venom arsenal. And this might be a conservative um, estimate because recently some people have found even more peptides in snail arsenals. The important thing to know is that no two snails, even if they're the same species, have exactly the same venom arsenal. The cocktail varies, right? And especially between snails and snakes. There are similar components within the venom, but they're not exactly the same. So venoms are very species specific. The second thing to know about um, venoms is that they attack conserved physiological um, targets. I like to say that they go for blood, brains, and membranes. Essentially what they're going for are the strongholds of an organism that helps it to stay intact and maintain integrity, right? So um, the, if they're going for the blood, they're hemotoxic. If they're going for the brain, they're neurotoxic. And if they're attacking and breaking cell walls, we call that cytotoxic. What most of the venom peptides that we work with do is they target these things called channels, which are on the surface of um, uh, surface of cells, channels and receptors. So what you're looking at here is a neuromuscular junction where one neuron is signaling to another neuron. And those um, pink and green and orange and blue things that you see on the surface of those cells, those are what we call iron channels and receptors. And so from working with cone snails, uh, several pep venom peptides have been identified that either block those channels, like they block sodium channels or they block potassium channels, or they sort of um, enhance and sort of, uh, so you have antagonists and agonists. So they enhance them and they are able to prolong and keep the channel open, uh, uh, and as you'll see there. So we work mostly with snails, but all venomous creatures have peptides that are able to do this. Now just think about it. For the snails that we work with, there are maybe 400 different um, species of terebrate snails, each producing maybe 250 or more toxins in its venom arsenal. Now, if we think that exponentially, snakes, spiders, scorpions, sea anemones, lampreys, uh, insects, and, and assassin bugs, all of these are producing a cocktail of several hundred um, uh, toxins. And so if it rapidly, exponentially starts to increase the amount of, of, of venom peptide that's out there. And that's what's exciting to a lot of pharmaceutical companies, because here you sort of have a natural library of organisms that, of, I'm sorry, a natural library from these organisms that we know work because you saw the fish eat the snail. I mean, the snail eat the fish. So we know that these peptides are bioactive and we know that they work and they work fast and they are very um, selective, and they're also very potent, which are all the ingredients you need when you're kind of making a drug. Which leads to the third reason that the peptides um, are so good. They're a successful bio uh, biochemical innovation, and what they're very good at doing is manipulating cellular signal. And so for someone who's looking to take peptides and use them for pharmaceuticals, the kind of signals that we want to manipulate are signals that are malfunctioning, such as what occurs in diseases like pain and, and cancer, right? So we want to see if we can use venom peptides to specifically target those channels that are on the membranes of those cells that are malfunctioning and causing um, disorder and disease. So in my lab, what we do is we study the venom evolution of snails, but we do it sort of in a comparative manner by looking at other venomous organisms. We try to discover new venom peptides in the venom arsenal. We characterize the molecular function of these peptides predominantly at the surface of cells, at those ion channels and receptors. And then we identify therapeutic applications in um, pain and cancer. So initially, a lot of people, when you tell them venom to drugs, they go, mm, really? I don't, I don't think so, because you know we have Captain Venom, who's very evil and will kill you. And indeed, some, some of them will. But we also have Dr. Envenema, who is not evil. And what she's trying to do is figure out how venom works. So yes, if we were to inject a whole arsenal into a person, that would for sure kill them and it would be lethal. 
when we talk about venom to drugs, what we're hoping to identify are those individual peptides that selectively target those individual channels that might be mal malfunctioning. So as a scientist, our cha challenge is to figure out which peptides target which channels and is this a channel that is going to be important for manipulating um, disease and disorder or manipulating cellular function in general. So we can have fundamental information about how ion channels and receptors work. So we've had, um, currently there are about six FDA approved venom peptide or peptide venom peptide derived drugs on the market. And I'm gonna just tell you about three of those. Um, the first one is from the Gila Monster, it's called Exenatide and they use it to treat diabetes. This is a really nice story about how, you know, we can learn from nature because the Gila Monster is a binge eater. And so when it eats, it sort of lowers, um, it, in its saliva, it has molecules that will lower its blood sugar. And that's exactly what Exenatide does. It lowers blood sugar for diabetic patients. The next one is um, from the Brazilian pit viper and it's captopril and it's used to treat high, uh, high blood pressure. And so captopril is actually a breakthrough drug because uh, it's what we know as an ACE inhibitor. Now because of COVID, I think everybody knows what ACE inhibitors are, the target for the spike protein. <laughs> it's also <laughs> the target for captopril. <laughs> and so um, uh, captopril is a peptide that's derived from the venom inside of the, the pit viper and as I said, it's used to lower blood, blood pressure. And it's probably, ACE inhibitors are the, the, probably the most prescribed um, compounds uh, being used to treat uh, hypertension. And then the last one that I'll tell you about is of course from the snail, this is cone snails. And this, um, the first cone snail drug is on the market and it's used, it's called Prealt or Zyconotide. And it's used to treat chronic pain in HIV and cancer patients. And similar to exenatide and captopril, preol also is uh, what we would call a breakthrough drug because not only is it um, the first one from the snails, it's the whole peptide as it's expressed in the venom. So it's about 23 or 25 amino acids long and it's that whole peptide chain that became the drug. And it's what's remarkable about it is that it, it works similar to morphine but it is not addictive because it doesn't work on opioid receptors. It works on um, N-type calcium channels, um, but it does have one major drawback. But what's nice about, um, also nice about uh, pre-alt or zyconotide is that it showed us a new way of treating pain. So most pharmaceutical companies, when they were thinking about how do we attack pain or how do we look for new ways to treat pain, they were largely focused on opioids and opioid receptors, which as you know, led to this huge opioid addiction crisis that we still have in this country, even as we're dealing with the pandemic. And so what, what, um, what Preop demonstrated is that you don't have to work on opioids to target pain, you can work on something else. And so not just opioid, um, not just pre op there's several other peptides from these snails that can be used for treating um, pain addiction. And so pre op in particular has one really nasty <laughs> side effect in that it has to be delivered um, by a spinal tap because it works in the central nervous system. And so no one is going to sign up for this surgery. So the, its its use is very limited to people for whom morphine is no longer possible or who are in really intense chronic pain. But the pump is installed and then you're able to, to function because the drug is good. It's the delivery method that is not very nice. So in my lab, um, so just to give you a little bit more background about killer snails, we have three different kinds. So cone snails and the venom uh, peptides they have are called conotoxins. We have terebrid snails and what they produce are called ter teratoxins. And then you have turids and the peptides in their venom are called teratoxins. So a lot of the work that is out um, or what was known is from cone snails. In my group, we focus on terebrid snails because frankly, you need a niche and no one was working on them. So we decided why not? So the traditional way in which people would work on venomous um, organisms or even these snails is you would go to the, the beach and you would collect, collect as many of them um, that you could find. So size and quantity is what determined which species were studied and which arsenals were investigated. 
when I started to do this, I wanted to try a different method. I wanted to sort of learn from nature and see if we can use that sort of as a cheat sheet to help us identify the venoms that seem to be most active or seem to be having specific targets for things we were interested in. And in order to do that, we had to know a little bit more about the um, phylogeny of the snails. So basically the family tree of the snails. And this approach was called venomics. And so in that we we're combining evolution and diversity to use that as sort of our guide to help us discover where we should go. So for example, if um, the shell that Priault came from, uh, the snail that Priault came from, Conus magus, was on the branch in the middle, and we wanted to find other compounds like Priault that maybe perhaps uh, can be peripherally active, it helps to know where Conus magus is and who its relatives are, right? The close relatives. If we wanted to find something not related to prealt, then we would look at branches that are further away from the branch in the middle because we wanna find things that are not the same. So just by building the, the family tree, we already get a lot of information that is powerful information that will help us do sort of more target-driven discovery of the components in the venom. And so to build that tree, you have to go out and collect a lot of snails, which is not a hard job. <laughs> uh, you, you get to travel the world. These snails are found in tropical marine environments. And um, so we've collected with terebrids over uh, 1,700 samples. Uh, we've identified uh, 199 species, 69 of which are new. And uh, so we have about 48% uh, coverage of this family, of which there are roughly 400, 500 um, species known. And a lot of the expeditions were done in collaboration with um, Philippe Boucher and his group at the Paris Museum of Natural History. And so, yes, it seems glamorous, but then you realize, like, for example, um, when we did field work in Papua New Guinea, it takes about three days to get there. <laughs> you know, it's New York to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Singapore, Singapore to Papua New Guinea. Then finally you get into Port Moresby and then you take another little plane over to one of the small islands, get out of the plane, you get onto uh, the back of a four by four into the jungle and other places that where people might say is a road, but not quite. And then you travel on that road for several hours until you get to a port, then you dump into a boat and you go out to an island where even Google Maps can't find. By the time you get there, you're so exhausted, you're ready to eat and collect whatever you find. And so a little story about Air New Guinea, they are not the best at keeping reservations. And so you might spend an extra night in Hong Kong or Singapore because you find out your seat is no longer there, but it's a great company. And they're the only airline that actually will fly into Papua New Guinea. But once you're there, right, you're able to get um, your samples and you're able to collect DNA and, and map out the family tree of snails, which is what you see here. So everywhere that you see a black line are terebrate snails that have a venom apparatus and we know they're actively producing venom in their arsenal. So just by building this phylogenetic tree, we, we sort of leapfrogged how we collect these animals. So we don't just randomly go and collect whatever is there, we look for specific things that are on the black trail. And that helps us to both save time and money because you have to dissect out the venom glands from the shell. And these are very tiny glands. And so the worst thing is if you're dissecting, dissecting and you're not finding any venom glands at all. So by, by making this phylogenetic tree, we sort of um, enabled us to ensure that if we are collecting species that are along the black path, we would most likely find a venom, a venom gland there. So that's the first step. We made this phylogeny, we um, confirmed the species that are making, actively producing venom in their glands. And then the next step um, in the venomic strategy is we combine this with um, transcriptomic and proteomic techniques. So the transcriptomic and proteomic techniques are what tell us what is inside of the venom. So what are the peptide sequences that make up the complex cocktail? The transcriptome approach is using um, RNA. So we will extract RNA from, uh, from, the venom, from tissue in the venom gland, and then you sequence it. And then the proteomic approach is using the crude extract itself. So we would sort of milk the venom gland, take all the crude extract, and put it onto a machine called the mass spec. 
when you combine those data, you have a validated database because the transcript tome will tell you the potential for everything that's there, right? It's genes that are being expressed. So if you remember your central dogma, DNA makes RNA, RNA makes peptide or protein. Peptides are small proteins, right? So everything that is has the potential for being expressed, every peptide that has the potential for being expressed in the venom gland, we will find by transcriptome. Whereas the proteome will tell us all the peptides that are actively being used and expressed. So when you combine them, you have a legit cocktail of all the things that the snail was making at the time when you harvested it. And so we wanted to apply our terebrid arsenal that we've amassed of over 3,000 or so um, new peptides that have not been characterized before. We wanted to apply it to the pain, pain problem, right? So how can we find new peptides that will help to alleviate pain without causing addiction? And so for us, we came up with this, um, this assay working in collaboration with the Adam Claderich Chang's group in which we would look for these new peptides that have similar um, cysteine scaffold. So all of these peptides sort of are bound together by a Velcro uh, called a uh, uh, thiol group. <laughs> And these different Velcro bindings dictate sometimes their molecular target. So we were looking for peptides that had the same kind of Velcro connections that had activity for, um, for treating pain. And then we would inject these peptides uh, peripherally into flies or we fed them orally into the fly and we would then apply it to an assay to see if there's activity. The important how we deliver the peptide to the fly is important because if we're trying to avoid spinal taps, we want to find things that you don't have to inject into the central nervous system, but you could put into, you know, the bloodstream or you can feed orally like a pill. So if we find peptides in our assay that seem to inhibit um, pain, we already are past like a major hurdle of peptide drug discovery in that most peptide drugs have to still be injected in, uh, in some way, like insulin. So our assay that we developed is this um, fly noxious heat avoidance assay. It's basically a, a sort of a hot bath and you put the flies on the top of this hot bath where um, if they stay close to the, the water, the temperature is pretty warm for them. And so they will immediately sort of fly up into away from the, the noxious heat. So we put the flies in there, we inject them or feed them our peptides, and then we monitor how long they they can last, basically. <laughs> how much of this hot bath will you want to be? It's like a hot tub for, for flies <laughs> if you don't feel the pain. If you feel the pain, it's not a good, a good look. And so you're trying to get away from that. So um, then we measure the tolerance for heat. Um, and, and one peptide we found had a really nice tolerance and the, these flies were able to stay in the hot tub a lot longer than others. When we compared with a control substance in which there was no tolerance for heat, you see that the flies immediately sort of um, fly back to that zero baseline. But if there is tolerance, they're below the zero baseline for a little bit, and then eventually maybe the peptide wears off and then they're, they're back to flying away from the bath. So this was, this was really fun for us and really great because we, we sort of identified a peptide that is peripherally active and, and it seems to have, you know, um, anti-pain activity, so analgesic activity. And so the next step for us is then identifying the target. So where is that peptide going and what is it targeting to enable these flies to enjoy their hot tub for as long as they are? And so to answer that question, we are now uh, starting to make, and this is exciting because we're actually now starting to get results from this. We are making these um, peptide fusions in which we put a, a tag that lights up, it's a fluorophore of some sort, onto our peptides. And then we then feed that or peripherally inject it into the flies. And then we can then image uh, what, where the peptide is going in the fly. And so we can then um, find, and because flies are, uh, are a model organism, the genetic mapping of the flies is very well known. So we can image a particular tissue and we can figure out what kind of receptors might be present in that tissue. And then we sort of narrow down the target for where the peptide might be acting. And so this is really exciting because we, we think this is a really innovative way to identify um, new peptides that 
potentially might be active because we're using whole model, whole animal models. We're not doing it in a cell line that's a little bit reductionist. We're doing it in the whole animal. And we're able to sort of maybe um, identify things that might be peripherally or orally active. So when we think about getting, you know, drugs from the sea, the pharmacy, pain is one thing and one area in which a lot of peptides, especially from snails, are being applied. But another growing area that um, venom peptides are being applied is cancer. And so the answer, um, anti-cancer activity of venom peptides started uh, with um, the honeybee, actually. So the Western honeybee, um, the, you might know um, melatonin, it's a 26 amino acid long peptide that was discovered in the, the venom arsenal of this bee. And it's been used on uh, or seemed to have activity on various cancer types from leukemia to melanoma, cervical cancer, bladder cancer. And what it does, it seems like it, it stimulates damage of DNA, which activates apoptosis, inhibits um, metastasis, and then also inhibits uh, epithelial masconal transfer, which is a big word, <laughs> EMT, basically for meaning the cancer can move around. Another peptide um, that has had um, some exposure as an anti-cancer activity is from the yellow scorpion RKA, RK1. It's 14 amino acids long. It's been indicated in uh, glioblastoma and melanoma, and it works by suppressing metastasis and angiogenesis. And then the last one I'll talk to you about is, um, or in this table, is uh, CTX3, which is from the Chinese cobra. It's 66 amino acids long, and it's been indicated in breast cancer, and it works by suppressing EMT. So what's, what's really amazing about this table is that not only that diversity of, of organisms from which you, their venom peptides are active against cancer, but it's also the diversity of mechanisms for how these peptides are active. So we have apoptosis, which is basically um, programmed cell death. We have metastasis, which basically is inhibiting how the cancer spreads to different sites. We have angiogenesis, which is inhibiting how um, the tumors get blood, the development of new blood vessels. And we have EMT, which is sort of the inhibition of how cancer migrates from one um, tissue to another. And so with venomous peptides, we've already demonstrated that they're very effective at manipulating some of the major targets that pharmaceutical companies look for when they want to figure out how are we going to um, stop cancer, right? And so this is a really exciting way because just as with pain, it's demonstrating that there are many mechanisms from which you can use these venom peptides to get to a result. And so in our lab, we wanted to focus on liver cancer. And so liver cancer is a growing threat in the United States. The incidence of liver cancers has tripled since 1980. The overall death rate has more than doubled um, uh, in from 1980 to 2016. And it's the fifth most common cause of cancer death for, for men and the seventh most common cause for, for women. And so what we wanted to do was figure out, can we use what we know as the specificity of our venom peptides to target to the, the channels that are found on the membrane of tumor cells? And can we then produce a drug that will be very selective at, at hitting only tumor cells and not hitting normal cells? So essentially, in this um, video, you'll see the pink is a tumor cell, the blue is an iron channel, and the green are healthy cells. This is the liver. And then these um, orange snaky things are our peptides who are selective only for the iron channels that are being overexpressed in the tumor cells, not for the channels that are found in the healthy cells. So this is a way to make um, a, a cancer therapeutic that is much more selective and then the treatment then is much more, let's say humane, because that's one of the issues with cancer, right? Most of the treatments on the market are not selective. They kill healthy cells as well as tumor cells. And that's why patients have such a rough time going through um, cancer treatment. And so we know that this mechanism or this um, approach that we want to use will work because there are several iron channels that mediate um, tumor cell survival death and motility. And whether we're talking about cell migration or cell cycle control, adhesion, invasion and metastasis, there's different, different channels that are overexpressed in the tumors at various stages. And so 
what we did was we screen a bunch of cancer cell lines in the lab, basically borrowed, begged, or we didn't steal any of them. <laughs> we bought them, <laughs> borrowed, bought, or, or begged for. And, and so we had cervical cancer, which is um, neuroblastoma, prostate, and liver cancer. And so in, in blue are cell lines in which we applied no treatment whatsoever. So no venom peptides were treated. In green is where we apply a venom vehicle. And in red is where you have a common cancer therapy that's available on the market right now, Docs Rubinson. So the thing to notice is that Docs is indiscriminate, right? So it kills prostate, liver, neuroblastoma, and cervical cancer across the board. With our venom vehicle, what we noticed is it doesn't do anything with cervical or neuroblastoma or prostate, but it seems to be very effective at inhibiting liver cancer. It's not as effective as doxorubicin, but for us, it was a starting point because it, the selectivity is one of the components that we were looking for. We wanted something that would be selective, and this seemed to be selective for liver cancer. And so when we identify what the peptide was, it was a TV1 peptide, which has a new fold. And we had identified this peptide a couple of years ago. And so it was exciting to see that it's, we can figure out what it's doing and how it might be able to work. So we then injected the peptide into mice and we did a, a model in which we took the tumor cells and put them um, subcutaneously into the mice and then injected our, our peptide. So there's a control model, which is in red, no treatment. And then the, the uh, treatment model or of the mice in which we're injecting a very uh, high dose of our TV1 peptide. And as you can see over um, seven day treatment, the, the study actually went for a couple of weeks that the size of the tumors in the, the mice that were getting our TV1 peptide were much smaller than the tumors in the non-treated peptide. So again, everyone was excited because <laughs> this all looks promising, but you still need to know where is this peptide working and how is it working? And so to do that, we first had to identify what channels are present in the cell lines that we were working with. So here um, in, in pink are the normal cell lines, BNL, and in blue are the tumor cell lines, uh, one mere. And so we uh, did a technique in the lab in which we were able to see what was being overexpressed in the tumor cell lines that might be attracting our peptide. And so um, it turned out that TRIP channels, TRIP C6, were being overexpressed in the one mere cells, the tumor cells, compared to the normal cells. So then we did a bunch of um, co-localization experiments to see if this is actually true. And by co-localization, what I mean is we take our peptide, we add a floor four of, of tag. In this case, it was a Fitzy tag, so it glows green. Um, and then we put a different colored tag on the channel itself. In this case, we put a red channel. So the chip channel is glowing red. And then when you co, um, when you overlay those two signals, if everywhere you see red, you see green, that means that the peptide and the channel are co-localizing. The blue represents the, um, the nucleus of the cells to tell you that the cells are viable. So we did see that for trip C6 and another channel trip C6, both of which indicated that the TV1 peptide might be working on trip channels. So our current working model is that we think the peptide is inhibiting trip channels, which is preventing calcium from entering the cells because that's what um, these trip channels do. They allow calcium to move from one side of the cell membrane to another side of the cell membrane. And so when you starve the cell of calcium, you have these downstream effects, which leads to um, uh, a inhibition of several different proteins like COX-2 and, and PGE2. And then that results in inhibition of um, proliferation. You induce apoptosis, and then you might also inhibit uh, angiogenesis, which is how blood gets to the tumor. So this is currently our working model for how things are working. And we're, we're, we're excited because it seems to be a, you know, um, a way to identify novel peptides that are active against and selective for liver cancer. And so we think that um, TV1 is, 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 again, it's not as good as doxorubicin, but what we do have now is a scaffold that we can tinker with in the lab to try to make it more effective at killing the liver cancer cells. And what I didn't show you is that um, in other uh, data, 
where we compare TV1 with uh, cancer cells versus normal cell lines, it is more effective at killing the, the tumor cell lines and it is less effective at killing normal cell lines. So the selectivity isn't just for the kind of cancer, it's also selected for just the tumor cell lines versus healthy cell lines, which is great. Um, and I'm gonna end soon. Uh, and what I wanted to um, end with was a short story about the history of, of, of peptide drugs. So we know that insulin is the first drug and it still has to be injected, even though we, for the most part, we discovered it almost 100 years ago. We had a big breakthrough with peptide drugs in 63 with Bruce Merrifeld, who was at the Rockefeller University. And um, he identified a way for us to synthesize peptides synthetically. And then that led to a whole innovation in the field. And so similarly, we think that the Venomics approach will lead to another innovation in the field. And currently, as I said, there are several peptide drugs that have been approved or peptide derived drugs that are on the market. Um, because we don't have a model system for characterizing venom peptides, uh, there's not much that we can do because you can't rear them in the lab. So if we want to figure out how genes are weaponized for ecological and, ther and therapeutic advantage, because remember the genes make the peptides, we kind of have to come up with a novel modeling system for manipulating venom peptides. And so currently um, the lab is looking to do that using organoids. So the idea is where organoids are like 3D representation or mini organs basically, or, or what they are. So it's 3D representation uh, of um, cells of different organs and tissue. And so we wanted to make you know venom gland organoids. So can we take these venom glands and make a 3D representation in the Petri dish so that we would have bench tap models and then we can apply genetic engineering tools to really manipulate the kinds of peptides that are made in the venom gland. We can ma manipulate um, how they fold and learn a lot about how these venom genes evolved over time and how they became weaponized. So we wanted to do this also because during COVID, we cannot fly anywhere. And so we're sort of shut down. So kind of like how we were stockpiling, you know, beans and toilet paper, we wanted to be able to stockpile our venom gland organoids. And so there are issues about reproducibility and the quality, but we really think this might be a way in which we can combine what we were doing with phenomics to help advance um, what's sometimes called precision, precision medicine or mainly to make more targeted smart drugs. And so the potential of venom research, I think, of course, is very high. <laughs> uh, the World Economic Forum recognized it as a future frontier of science. We have an, uh, a community now. There's a venom conference, uh, the Gordon Conference, that happens um, every two years. We had the first one in 2018, and the 2021 was canceled due to COVID, like everything. But there will be a 2022 meeting. And, and so I think venom research is really this sort of transdisciplinary moonshot where you have um, really comprehensive and comparative methods that can come together, where you have a peptide chemist can work with an evolutionary biologist, can work with you know, computational scientists or data scientists to really figure out what these arsenals are doing and how we can use them for the benefit of humanity. So strap on your, your venom boosters and I hope that you'll come along for the ride. And so I hope that I've shown you that um, Venom and venomous animals aren't just agents of fear, but they're actually agents of change and innovation. And with that, I'd like to thank some of the members in the lab, past and present, and I will take any questions that you have. Also, our collaborators, because of course, a lot of this work is collaborative. I mentioned Philippe Boucher at the Paris Museum of Natural History. who We do a lot of our collection trips with, and then there's several others as well. Adam. Um, with the fly work. And so I'd like to thank everybody else. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> thank you, Mandy. That was a wonderful talk, really interesting. And we thank have lots, <laughs> lots of questions for you. <laughs> so let me just uh, go to the top of the screen here. Um, and first question, I'm wondering if you can harness this to treat headaches when other meds do not work Could this. To treat headaches, mm, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, migraines are very complex, but for us, it's mostly if you can find a specific channel that it's targeting, or if you can figure out what signal is malfunctioning, 
um, and the peptide has a target that it can go to, then that pretty much dictates the application for treatment that we can apply it to. And there are various things. It's been used for epilepsy, it's been used for pain, uh, heart attacks, and all kinds of, of different things are currently being investigated at various um, stages of, of pharmaceutical development. Great, thank you. Uh, a couple of related questions. One, uh, first, uh, the, the more scientific version of it and a more general one after mm -hmm. that. So uh, uh, the peptides in the cocktail, are they a result of recombination or splicing? So we think that the peptides are um, new functionalized uh, housekeeping genes. They are, it's expressed as one gene and then they're, they're cleaved off, the mature pop peptide is cleaved. Um, and so the, the short answer is we don't really know. We assume it's recombination and splicing and other things. And so there's an ongoing um, work to look at how these venom genes evolve. And that's what organoids would help you to investigate, right? So if you're able to manipulate the expression of the genes in sort of like a real time setting, you can learn more about how the genes are, uh, how the peptides are being made. Yeah, and related to that, um... Why does the cocktail, why is it so different between individuals? Like what's, this do you know the, the purpose for that? This is the big mystery. <laughs> this is the, the million dollar question. Why do you need so many? It, it's more, um, uh, the thinking is that there's an arms race going on, right? So, you know, the snake and the mongoose, uh, one is trying to stay alive, one is trying to have a meal. And so you have these peptides that are evolving just as the receptors that they're trying to target is evolving. And so the peptides are constantly changing to try to keep up with the target is, is one potential answer for why there's so many. And also, I mean, you think of it as there's a snail, it's got to make sure it works, right? <laughs> because the snail usually won't get a second shot. So you can't rely on one thing to do that. You need a sort of cluster bomb coming at you <laughs> to make sure that 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 fish is not going to move. Uh, what are the key properties that make a peptide amenable to injection or oral delivery? What are the key properties? Key properties that make a peptide amenable to being another, another key question. Um, so there is there are peptides that are that can cross the blood brain barrier and um, and so we are not sure. It's sort of a, um, a Rosetta Stone mystery that has not been solved, right? So it's not just the size because some of the peptides that can cross the blood-brain barrier are about 25 amino acids long or more, similar to pre-alt. Um, it's, it's not just the, the, the connectivity of the peptides um, or the amino acid makeup. So there's, there's a lot that we don't know about how the peptides work in the re in the ecological setting because you see that that was instant right so there must be peptides working at both the peripheral and the central nervous system level and able to you know penetrate membranes and do whatever it needs to do to get to its target but we haven't been able to figure out what that is um, in the lab and not just my lab you know I'm not slacking it's everybody <laughs> uh, do plants have peptide venoms Plants, um, there are some plants that produce toxins. Um, this is an interesting thing. So you have sometimes poisonous plants and who have toxins. And so you can have um, poisonous things from what you eat or what you associate with. Venomous things have to be made endogenously. Uh, so if the plant is making the toxin, then it can be a venomous plant. But if the plant is getting the toxins from association with an insect or something else, then it would be a poisonous plant. Uh, should I be worried about getting bit by a cone snail? I guess that the question is, is there an anti-venom? <laughs> no, 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 we don't have an anti-venom because um, not a lot of people die from cone snail envenomations. It's, uh, it's sort of a, 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 a horrible side effect for the, the 1%. It's usually divers. <laughs> So see a pretty shell and they want to bring it up to the surface and so they'll stick it into their dive suits and the snail will feel threatened and then it will attack. Um, it also can be fisher, fisher, fishermen because the snails might be caught in the fishing nets, but they're not aggressive. They are snails. They retreat into the shell when they, when they feel threatened, when they are picked up or feeling attacked. And there are only specific species that are, are lethal to humans. Most of those are in the Indo-Pacific 
and Australia. <laughs> Australia, everything there will kill you. And so <laughs> we're safe here in the Northeast because the waters are not warm enough, not yet anyway, with global warming. Um, but, uh, and, and so the, 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 the pep, the, the chances are, yes, you, you will die if you get one of those lethal species, um, because we don't have a cure. It's not like snakes where people are actively working on venoms, anti-venoms for snakes, because the numbers of people who die from snake bites is huge, actually. And it's one of the tropical neglected diseases. So there are lots of anti-venom treatments and, and cures and research going on there, not so much for, for snails. You mentioned that these venoms came to be through convergent evolution. Do you see patterns between the potential medical uses of the venoms and the family of organisms that, evolved, that they evolved in? For example, are mollusk venoms best for pain and arthropods best for anti-cancer? Is there that kind of a correlation? I don't think we've identified enough drugs from the animals to, to make that kind of correlation. We do know that the peptides from snails are much smaller than like peptides from snakes, for example, or, or, or scorpions, which tend to be bigger. Uh, they're more like proteins or polypeptides. And that influences um, how you synthesize and how likely it is that you might be able to turn it into a drug. You see the um, melatonin um, from the honeybee is 66 amino acids long. It's huge, right? Whereas um, the, the TV1 that we found is about 21 amino acids long. And so while we don't know enough about, you know, snake venoms are good for this, we know that um, for the most part, snake venom peptides seem to be neurotoxic. A lot of the early work and the current work have involved how they manipulate neurons. But we've seen like from our work that they basically will work with any cell membrane that has uh, a channel that the peptide can target. Um, and most of the, the, the venoms from, from snakes are, are, are proteases for the most part. So we know the types of information from the different animals, but we can't really say that these are the ones that are gonna work on you know, pain and these are the ones that are gonna work on other kinds of diseases. Uh, another question, are there uh, plentiful supplies of these uh, snails for continued research and commercial development um, of the medicines? I think that's what's great about your approach is I guess once you identify the, the peptide, you don't have to go back to the source, but no. um, it's an interesting yeah. question. Um, yes, yeah, no, we, um, the, the snails are currently not threatened. They're not endangered species. Well, the, the cone snails that live in coral reefs, which are <laughs> disappearing, those are an issue, but um, our snails are mostly sand dwellers. Um, and, and it's because of conservation that we were looking at the phylogenetic tree, right? Because you don't, when you go out to collect on an expedition uh, and you're getting all these animals, you don't know which is which, you have to sort of crack all those shells and sacrifice. But if we have the phylogenetic tree, which tells us that, you know, follow the black trail, these guys should have a venom gland and those guys don't. So if we pick up things that, don't have a venom gland, we can toss them back in the water and just focus on the ones that, that do. So we, we try to practice you know, conservation while we're out in the field. Can, can you comment on how difficult uh, it is to get permits to do this work throughout the world? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> That's why I let Philippe do that in the Paris Museum. <laughs> It, it's a process. If you want to go on an expedition, um, for example, in 2023, you basically have to start working on it now uh, because there's there's a lot of paperwork, both exporting and importing the, the animals and um, making sure that you're doing it in, in ways that are safe and, and with permission from, from the native country to, to leave, which is a changing situation, right? So, so pre-alt, um, uh, it come, the conus magus is found in the Philippines and the drug was, and all the research and development was done here in the US. So when the company that made it started to make any kind of a profit, none of that profit went back to the Philippines. And so they got very upset and started to sort of shut down their borders for collection and wanted you to sign you know, deals saying you would give a percentage of any drug that you found from an animal. So it, it's, it's, it, it's a very sensitive, area right now about how we're going to sort of, you know, share profits. And especially with the, the, 
right now we're in the UN decade of the ocean. So between 2021 and 2030, one of the big issues is how do we do, you know, blue biotech? How do we, cause there are lots of things we're finding in the ocean and how do we do it in a way that's equitable and sustainable for the nations for which they don't have the capacity for R and D, right? So we are paying all that money. It takes a lot of money to make a drug, but without the animal, you wouldn't have a shot. So <laughs> something has to be worked out but how we can make it more equitable. And, and I like that um, the UN Decade of Oceans, they have like the three Gs, they say they have geography, gender, and, um, and generations. And so they're really trying to bring everybody along in this decade and see how we can solve problems like sharing um, STEM capacity building in nations that have these um, uh, biodiverse animals. We only have a couple more minutes here, and there's so many good questions. So I'm afraid mm -hmm. we're not going to get to them all. But I saw um, one is, is Venom and Venom dating our Venom and Venom. <laughs> the dating question of you know Captain Venom and Doctor and Venom. <laughs> <laughs> They're more like my, mirror images. <laughs> uh, what's the uh, the biggest fish that can be paralyzed, and does that tell you something about dose dependency? biggest fish that can be paralyzed. It's all about um, uh, dosage, right? Yeah, so it's um, these snails. It's funny, if, you, if you're if you a, a film buff, someone had sent me this where in Jurassic Park, the guy dips his, his, um, his uh, arrow in cone snail venom to bring down the T-Rex. <laughs> so that of course is <laughs> fictionalized, but it's all about how potent the toxin is. So if you're using something like, for example, from Conus um, geographus, which is extremely lethal, then you have to, um, then you have to be very careful because that can take down a human being, right? A 200 pound guy in a couple of hours because there's no cure for that. So it's all about who's, who's venom you're working with. Okay, and uh, maybe one last question. Have you looked at peptide targeting to cancers using antibodies or antigens on cancer cells? Using antibodies? Uh, oh, to make the pep, oh, so this is work that I haven't done in my lab, but other people have tried because the peptides are so selective and um, antibody drugs seem to be also be working very well. The, the peptide could help to get, um, so you have something like what they call a, a dual dual agent in that you can get the peptide to the, to the tumor and then it also will help to treat in inhibiting channels and things like that. No, it's very interesting area of work, but we haven't pursued that uh, as yet in our, our lab. Great, thank, thank you so much, Mandy. Um, thank you guys. I'm gonna turn things back over to Chris to wrap up the evening. Um, and thank you so much for a great talk and interesting Q&A session. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Mandy. That was amazing. And the most questions, definitely, they're still coming in. So <laughs> you definitely captivated the attention of our audience. And we're really grateful for your time and sharing your stories and work with us. And thank you, Andrea. Thank you also to the 1911 Trust, James and Gail Bacon for sponsorship and to everyone for joining us and continuing to support GMGI's mission. If you're inspired by what you heard tonight, consider joining GMGI. We are growing and we have current openings highlighted on our website. I would love to hear from you. Also, as we put the pandemic behind us, we look forward to opening our doors once again, doing events like this in person and as Mandy suggested with cocktails um, and also <laughs> offering tours of our research institute, our academy, and um, just spending time and having a chance to chat again, again together. Please stay tuned and stay in touch. We have one more inspiring scientist lined up for our spring series. Um, that's happening in May. And we have already begun booking some incredible speakers for the fall, including Stephen, Dr. Stephen Palumbi of Stanford University, who will kick off the fall series on September 16th. I'm gonna quickly post a slide right now of our next speaker for you. So stay on one more minute so you can save the date. Thank you again, Mandy and Andrea. Good night, everyone. And I'll see you next month. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.